you're on mute. Thanks so much. Um, we're just going to go ahead and start since it's 12 o'clock and we're going to allow for folks to trickle in. Um, on behalf of the Multicultural Research Center and the Office of Diversity and Outreach, um, as well as the Preterm Birth Initiative, we are excited to welcome back um, Dante King for the second part of um, his book launch. And this is going to be a question and answer and an opportunity for us to um, engage a little bit uh, more deeply into the content of um, his first book. Um, and before we start, um, we actually wanted to open up the session um, or open up this event with a land acknowledgement. Um, land acknowledgements allow us to recognize and uplift uh, the violent acts of colonialism that have happened and continue to happen to indigenous peoples here in the US and globally. Um, we would like to acknowledge the Ramatushaloni people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramatushaloni elders, past, present, and future, who call this place the land that UCSF sits upon their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatushaloni community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Um, so this UCSF land acknowledgement was actually created um, with the organizing and leadership of various indigenous groups at UCSF, um, the Native American Health Alliance, also known as NAHA, and the Association of Native American Medical Students, um, also known as ANAMS, um, who worked collaboratively with Ohlone representatives and with the support of the Office of Diversity and Outreach and the Multicultural Resource Center. Um, so I just wanted to uplift some ways that we can support and practice solidarity locally with Indigenous people in the Bay Area. Um, and the main part of that is really about building relationships with Indigenous peoples um, and communities and supporting any um, rematriation efforts that they are leading. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and send some of those resources and also the use of land acknowledgement um, into the chat. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Alexis Cobbins, who's going to start us off. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A session with Dante King. Um, he has definitely up-leveled the work that we do at PCBI through his training and information and knowledge that he shared with us, um, really opened up our view about um, anti-Blackness and the history of how we got here. Um, and so we will be inviting you all to submit any questions that you have to the chat. Um, I do want to also acknowledge that this is a part two. We had a part one session um, where some topics were covered and I believe that session is recorded and available. So um, in the event that we get a lot of questions and we can't get to them, we may skip over some of the questions that were covered um, at the first session. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's awareness. And so um, Dante, I don't know if you have any opening remarks before I get into the first question. And those of you all that have questions, please go ahead and start submitting your questions now. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Hill, uh, Dr. Lamisha Hill. Thank you to Melissa Bautista for being such um, wonderful, consistent leaders um, in this work and supporters of, of my work. Um, and thank you to you, Alexis, for agreeing to um, really partner with me and for all of the support and um, that you have given, that you've provided to me personally uh, through the endeavor of writing this book as well as other endeavors. I want to acknowledge my mother who's on today. I saw her name, I saw her show up. Uh, Deborah King Cooper, um, as I say to people all the time, she is my religion. Uh, there is no greater human being on this planet than my mother, and I just love you dearly. I also wanted um, to acknowledge some other individuals that I saw on here um, as people were coming on. I see Kathy Broussard, who is a very um, near and dear friend to me. She's one of my best friends. I also see Alicia St. Andrews. Um, she falls in that category as well. And for anyone who attended 
the book the book launch event that was held on February 1st. Um, she was on there with us at the time. I want to acknowledge also um, Angela Thomas. I see uh, Michelle Meyer. I see Zoe Galvez, <laughs> Nicole Joe. Uh, these are all folks that I know but I haven't um, seen in a while. Um, and so thank you so much for um, joining. I also, there's someone else who's very, very special to me today who has influenced my journey and my path um, up to this point. And I've been knowing this person for more than 30 years. And that is Dr. Rochelle Rogers Ard. I want to um, acknowledge her. She has been a friend. Uh, she was uh, one of my high school teachers. But beyond that, she's been a mentor and a confidant and also a partner in this work. Um, I also want to say hi to Carol. Carol, um, I see Carol on here, Carol Gay. All right, um, so with that said, I'll uh, turn it back over to you. But before I do, I, I want to share um, two quotes, which I believe capture um, sort of the essence of my book. Um, I have received feedback from many people um, over the last few months. And some tend to have a particular conception and or framing that they walk away with um, as they have engaged my book and or you know, have, have read it. And that ties directly into the, the antebellum period or the period that, that we know and or reference as in the enslavement period here in America. And I want to um, do a little bit of reframing um, and then, then I'm gonna hand it back over um, to you, Alexis. Um, so these two quotes, I believe, capture the essence of what I was attempting to do in my book, which is, was, is to focus on the um, direct impacts that linger from the period, from the period of, of, of North, Ameri North American colonialism um, that embodies or encompasses a, a variety of different things. One being the creation of whiteness and or white identity, um, different from how it had, a, um, different, different from the manifestations of different European ethnic groups that appeared here during that period. Um, there are some unique things that happened during that, that period. And then also the, the creation or the creating and or shaping of blackness and or what becomes known as black identity and or black culture and how an anti-black orientation began to be built um, during that, that time period. And because we do not learn and or really, you know, these two points of, of focus are not necessarily available or focused upon during our, what I would refer to as at least my primary educational experience, I thought it important to, you know, reshape this origin story, similarly to what Nicole Hannah Jones is doing with the 1619 Project. Um, and really shine a light on the, the absence of nuance and detail that we are provided when we look at history um, in this culture, in this country, when it is taught to us. So um, the first quote that I'll share is from Dr. Um, Aruna Kilanani. And this is from an interview that she um, gave to Mark Lamont Hill on the Black News Channel this was, um, I believe, probably mid to end of last year. And he asked her um, in a question that he posed to her based on a talk that she had given at Yale, which is where she works. But he asked her if she believed that white people were psychopathic. And her response to him was, um, I think so. She says, um, I, I think there are many lies the level of lying that white people do that has started since colonialism, we're just used to it. Such as every time you steal a country, you loot. You say you've discovered something. We don't say that we killed all these people. 
we got rid of the Native Americans, we say we discovered America. You don't talk about the level of death. You don't talk about the level of what actually occurred. You wipe the slate clean. You sanitize the violence and you actually got lost along the way. You tried to go to India. Then you say you discovered something. And this level of discovery is everywhere. You've discovered vegetarianism. You've discovered yoga. Everything is a discovery and it's all actually stolen. Um, the other quote that I wanna share is from uh, Dr. Amos Brown, and there are two. He says, we have a school system that is based upon the psychology of white children and white people. We are trying to educate our children in that system. They are bound to fail. The very structure of the educational system itself is based upon a white model, and therefore it has a built-in failure mechanism for us one way or the other. Um, and the last one, which I believe is um, all are important, but I, I really wanna emphasize this one. He says, European historiography functions to maintain a social system to psychologize and create a personality orientation in its readers or hearers through force, deceit and mental manipulation. European historiography creates normative beliefs and pathologies that conditions the mind and behaviors of the oppressed. I would also add that it also has impacts and effects on the oppressors as well and or people um, who identify within the white organization. So with that said, I will um, turn it back over to you, Alexis, and we can get started. Okay, sorry, I think I was having a little tech difficulty, but I'm back. <laughs> so first question, we'll get right into it. Um, can Dante please talk about the role of white women in slavery? I've heard that white women were very active in supporting and enforcing slavery because it made their lives a lot easier. Um, thank you for sharing the question. And uh, thank you to the person who submitted this. I believe um, it was one of the questions that was submitted prior to this event. Um, so I won't focus a lot on, on this during um, this particular talk. Uh, one of the things, one of the references I, I will share with you, and there, there are actually two. Um, the book stamped from the, in the book stamped from the beginning, actually three. Um, Dr. Ibram Kendi, he talks about this um, somewhat, but doesn't scale it um, to the degree that some of the other references that I'm gonna share uh, do. So Stamp from the Beginning would be one book. I think another one would be um, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGru. Um, but the third reference that I, I will share with you is um, They Were Her Property by, uh, written by Dr. Stephanie Jones Rogers. In this book, she talks about, to a grave extent, uh, uh, in a very um, nuanced fashion, uh, providing lots of documentation, um, how white women were substantially involved um, in the slave trade. She talks about the ways in which they hired, purchased, disciplined, managed, and sold enslaved people, including playing a very avid role in separating children from their parents. Um, and this happened for many different reasons. Um, much of it due to uh, like just kind of capitalist uh, motivations if, or capitalistic motivations. Um, some of the other reasons though involved um, sending children off who might be the, the child who might have been fathered by their husbands. Um, she talked about how white women had all of the rights that um, enslaved, that slave owning men uh, possessed, um, how they acquired their slaves um, as be uh, bequests, uh, from bequests. Um, they were bequeathed by their, their parents, um, by their fathers mostly. Um, and she talks about the end of a period known as primogeniture where 
you know, prior to this period, many of the um, assets and, and the properties that were owned by white men predominantly were typically passed down to their sons uh, and typically the firstborn child, which was a practice that was um, um, both uh, legal and uh, cultural in terms of custom um, carried over from, from uh, co the colonial period. Um, she talks about how um, white women would use black women, would leverage the bodies of black women to um, be as wet nurses that she would, they, the, that black women were used as wet nurses and white women played a prominent role um, in doing this. One of the examples that she gives um, is, so I'll share two. One that um, Martha Washington, prior to marrying our first president, George Washington, she um, was married previously and she inherited uh, over 150 slaves. I believe the number was around 180 or so, or 184. Um, and she brought those enslaved people into the marriage with her, into her marriage with uh, George, President George Washington. Um, uh, so I shared these pictures with you. I think these represent pretty profound uh, imagery in terms of the realities that, that Black women faced. Um, during this period, and, and Black women, and, but also Black men, um, and Black boys and, and girls. And so, um, again, going back to the earlier point that I just made, how they represented, I think, I believe, uh, toward the end of the enslavement period, by 1863 or 1865, white women were 40% of slave the slaveholding um, population um, in America. So I found that to be pretty substantial. Um, and again, here's an ad um, that she discusses actually in her book um, regarding a, an, an enslaved woman, a woman, a, a young girl who was enslaved uh, named Anne, who was about 19 years old. And this is from Elizabeth Humphreyville. She's saying in this um, ad that her, she believes her husband actually kidnapped or her, uh, she believes her husband actually kidnapped and or, or had some type of influence in her running away. Um, you can also see um, these pictures where black women um, are being used as props essentially. Um, in this one picture, um, the, you know, this black woman is, is feeding this baby while someone's taking a picture. And I think that this um, captures just kind of the essence of the terrorism that that has been thrust onto the black body and particularly the black female body in this case. Um, and it encompasses so much. And then the, I, I, I put this picture here too. Um, I think this is really a substantial. And Alexis, I want to get your your thoughts about this picture as you see it here, because you work in uh, maternal health, you know. And when I saw this here, kind of just this black baby laying on the floor. If you're not paying attention, you could even miss that that the baby is there. But the um, neglect that is depicted here, while this black woman feeds this white child and provides you know, full nourishment and attention, um, et cetera. Did you, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I have multiple thoughts. Um, what's coming to me um, initially is how kind of this um, way that Black women were used um, for the purposes of breastfeeding has probably contributed to the current um, rates of breastfeeding initiation that we see and the attitudes that people have towards uh, Black women and breastfeeding. So I don't want to make it about what Black women are not doing, but also like what we're not, the encouragement that we don't get in the hospitals, um, the, the lactation support that we don't receive um, in the hospitals. And I think there are ways that this history 
has uh, made us have to cope with our children, being able to be taken away at any moment, not having autonomy over uh, the way that we have raised our children and the way that we um, took on some protective behaviors because things were out of our control and the way that that's right. used against uh, Black women now in terms of, oh, it's neglect, let's get child welfare involved. Mm -hmm. Oh, she doesn't have attachment to her child. She's not, she's not picking her baby up when they cry and things like that. So I think that all of this has, um, we've had to um, inhibit some particular behaviors that were protective at one point, but also that is flipped around on us and, and made us deem to be bad mothers or needing to have child welfare um, involved with us um, on the journey of uh, parenting. So that's what's yeah. coming for me. Thank you for sharing that. You know, one other thought I'll, I will share um, has to do with the ways in which Black people, um, I think what's represented in that photo, and if I were to make a correlation or connection into the experiences that we encounter today as Black people and how we are expected to take care of white people's feelings, their comfort, um, their, their safety in a sense, in terms of um, just kind of the built-in deference that we as Black people are in, ingrained with or um, instilled with from birth and how, you know, within these institutions, whether it be the educational institution or employment situations, we always have to be working to keep white people comfortable. And if white people are not comfortable, um, and this is one of the things that I talk about in my book, um, it could literally mean death for us and or total just um total destruction in terms of destroying our um, reputation our standing in the world and so on and so forth and it's expected it's expected so there's a lot that's represented in that that photo absolutely thank you agree i'm going to move us on to our next question um, next question. The cruelty and violence of American slavery was slash is the extreme cruelty and violence considered normal? Did other countries which used or condoned slavery have the same standards and practices? So I cannot really answer that question in the affirmative, you know, nor nor deny. I'm I'm not aware. What I can say is that the black and or Negro orientation in the way that it was embedded into the law. I've not seen other um, information that would lead me to believe that um, through the colonial period into the formation of the United States of America, that there were other countries that created legislation that specifically um, elevated and or reinforced um, the organization that we see as the white race or referred to as the white race or white people, as well as um, targeted um, people of African descent that were named as black people um, and took action to legislate against them. I, I do believe that that, um, insofar as I know and can see that that is a unique um, situation. This is a unique circumstance or these are unique circumstances um, as it pertains to America, North America, the North American uh, continent, um, particularly uh, the United States of America and what we uh, refer to as the British colonies. Thank you. I also, I know people have been joining us along the way and just want to let you all know if you have a question that you would like um, me to ask Dante, please feel free to submit it to me directly via the chat. Um, you can just send me a direct message with your question. I do want to say that someone sent a private message to me as I was sharing the information um, that I shared a moment ago about Stephanie Jones Rogers book, They Were Her Property. And I, you know, upon seeing that, that painting, this person says, I'm shaking, seeing that painting with grief. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. 
Next question. What ways did you practice care and concern for yourself while putting this work together? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I can't say that I did consciously because I didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into when I started to endeavor into this experience. I was really not aware of all of the things that I would find and or the depths of the types of information and or um, experiences that I would find. And I think what was most difficult was looking at the different ways that through the colonial period beyond. So I'm talking the period again that we refer to as the enslavement period. And out of that period throughout today, um, throughout, you know, the into the 21st century, that Black people have truly been under attack by the United States government, um, all branches at one time or another, but particularly uh, the United States Congress and um, the Supreme Court of the United States, because you know, those two branches of government at different periods of time have been in conflict with each other. So for example, you have the passage, and I think I spoke a little bit to this the last time, maybe I didn't, uh, but you've got the passage of the 14th Amendment um, happening, you know, within the late 1860s, um, 1868, I believe. And then, you know, between 1873 and in 1900, the Supreme Court is literally ruling that Black people aren't protected by under the 14th Amendment and giving states the jurisdiction, if you will, to legislate and or enforce laws according to how they see fit. And so you've got these Southern laws, which is where roughly 95 to 98% of Black people remain during that period. You've got these Southern states, Southern territories that have committed treason against the United States. And then they rejoin the union and are provided and enabled with the opportunity to legislate and, and interpret laws as they see fit. And because the laws that they are enforcing um, against black people are so unjust, you begin to see cases go to the Supreme Court. And so, and I'll, I can give one example, but um, I, I gave a few, I think the last time, but the Supreme Court of the United States is ruling that black people are, are inhuman they are ruling that white terrorism can take place and can be committed against black people. And so therefore you've got this very massive era of lynchings that take place, which I believe um, Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative, they've documented over 6,500. Um, but I um, assert and believe that there are tens of thousands more that, that were never documented essentially but that these things were facilitated by the government, the very government that we supposed to, that we are supposed to believe in, that we are supposed to feel some type of protection from. Um, and so you've got that happening. And then you've got in 1926, the Supreme Court ruling that racial restrictive covenants are legally binding documents due to a case that happens in Washington, DC. And all of these things are being done um, by a white American government, by a group of people um, who have support from the larger masses of their white constituencies and, and, and voters, if you will, um, who also believe this way and begin to um, enact and or practice you know, these ways of, of living and or being around Black people. And so 
it led me to understand how as a, both as it pertains to the past as well as into the present, how black people have really never been safe. And this is not about the KKK going out and enacting extreme uh, extremist acts against black people, but it is about the ways in which the government has been a pro-white government enacting laws and policies um, that are essentially affirmative action for white people. Um, and that's captured pretty fervently in the book, When Affirmative Action Was White by Ira Katz Nelson. There is another book by, um, by Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law, all, all of these things. And I can point you to um, many other references and resources. I actually put the link to my, my book list, some of the references um, that I refer to that are on my website. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, I, I offer to people, just go to the different state archives. Um, and again, going back to self-care, I don't believe that I have taken care of myself um, in the ways in which I should have or could have, because I also am a Black, present, black male presenting person. And I have suffered a lot of um, my own conflicts being um, in certain workspaces with, with certain people who believe that, you know, I should show up, that we should show up as Black people as disempowered. And so there was a lot, there was a lot going on for me while doing the research um, for this book, I would say over the last seven to 15 years. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, next question. Can you further explain the significance of white people's pattern of rewriting slash rewording atrocities with modern day examples? Sure. So let me post this here. I, I will say this, and I, I won't go too much into detail up with that question. Um, I the ways in which we learn in this environment, the ways in which we live in our modern day cultural environment, um, for, for those of us who are black and or not white, it's a process and or situation of forced conformity and forced assimilation. And one of the things that I strive to do was really peel back the layers about how <clears throat> that in and of itself is a particular type of violence. Um, and so there, there are many people that I could uh, point to in terms of that. Um, but for example, if we look at the way in which we are required to learn um, and I hear a noise in the background. Uh, but when I look at the ways in which we are required to learn in an, as, black, as Black people in an educational system that doesn't acknowledge our particular unique skills, gifts, et cetera, this educational system says that we must conform to XYZ standard, we must, we, we must learn how to think this way. We must do well in these set of subjects, which are extremely um, biased in terms of the ways in which they are taught uh, many times, in terms of the information that exists there. Um, and then, because we may not do well by those set of standards, we are then deemed not smart, not intellectual. Um, we might be diagnosed with some condition, some learning disability, because we are not acclimating to the environment and or um, conforming to the standards as they are laid out. Um, the focus is always on pathologizing Black people for not being adequate. And the whole system and situation is one of bias. I mean, the, there's so much within my primary educational experience 
that I it went through that I don't use today. I will never use it. I was not interested in it or with it. Just luckily, I found something that I could acclimate to. But again, it's an assimilar, um, it's a, a process of assimilation. Uh, and, and so I believe it is important for us to begin to peel back the layers on, on the infinite ways that we have been oppressed and to begin to see these things as violent because I see so many black children nowadays whose parents might look down upon them because they're not doing well in that system and or, um, you know, but the focus is not really on digging deep but beneath the surface to understand why they may not doing well and reinforcing the skills and gifts and, and, and innate talents that they possess. Um, and I believe that we just have to do more of that if we are going to be able to recover ourselves from the systems and the mindsets, uh, the mindsets of anti-Blackness and the mindsets of, of white supremacy and white domination. Thank you. Once again, want to let everyone know that this is a Q&A session. If you have questions that you would like to be asked, please feel free to submit them to me directly uh, via the chat in a direct message. And I'll move on to our next question. What can you do when you run into bias in the healthcare system? Do you have any tips for maneuvering through the system? Yeah, I think it's important um, within the context that we're in to be able to speak from your experience and, and try to formulate whatever it is you're observing in a way that, you know, whoever you're delivering the message to can understand it. Um, I also think it's important to find um, additional information and examples that actually speak to whatever it is you're observing, because I guarantee you, <laughs> I can almost guarantee you that there are studies in, in, that are out there. There are books that have, um, where, where people have written about how this bias shows up already um, or maybe showing up already. Um, but, you know, to, to back it up, to back up exactly what it is um, you're experiencing. I think what can be hard many times is that people, we want to acknowledge racism or we want to acknowledge bias in, in our institutions, and yet no one wants to be held accountable for the person that's um, acting in, in that way or in, 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 the, in, in the ways that are biased in any given situation. And so I think one of the other great American lies or white American lies is that there can be objectivity um, there, there's no objectivity. Everything is subjective based on our experiences, our sets of information, how we may come in to any given situation at any time, how we see different people. Um, and the fact that people try to play off this notion of fairness or that they're being objective, um, I think it serves to let a lot of people off the hook who should be held accountable and responsible. Um, and I know that when I have worked with different organizations and, um, you know, things begin to come up, many times, you know, people have a hard time with things being called out and or being held accountable. They just, they just don't want to be. I can recall an experience where I was in a meeting with a white woman and she was trying to um, uh, assert to me and to others, other colleagues who were in the space, that the way in which they were investigating employment, um, em employee investigations, or you know, uh, different uh, investigations involving employees, that the process was fair. And I, we were going back and forth, and I told her it's not fair at all. It's not fair. So if it's fair, then why are black employees? two to three times more likely to be disciplined in this particular um, space. 
There's nothing fair about that. There's nothing fair about the recommendations that may be coming forth from managers who want to discipline employees. There's nothing fair about the way in which HR is assessing and or analyzing or looking through these uh, different situations that come to us that supports that there's fairness going on because the result, the outcomes are substantially inequitable. And so I think we have to begin to call those things out and we need to investigate the root causes of the situation. So if we see an unfair or unjust outcome, what's behind it? Who was involved? What decisions got made? What decisions didn't? You know, who wasn't involved? Who, 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 who might we have needed to involve? Thank you. Our next question is, given how white comfort is so embedded in the workplace, are there tips on how to break that culture if those in charge, even those who are supposed to be supporting racial equity are working to enforce that white comfort? Yeah, um, I think, and I don't, I don't necessarily, I cannot say that I have the answer to this at all. I think white people have to be willing to take courage and put other white people on the spot in making them uncomfortable and that um, they need to do, they need to be active in the ways that they support people of color, um, especially black people and be willing to risk something to disrupt the comfort. Um, there are resources that I refer to that speak to this one um, being the dismantling racism framework, uh, framework, sorry, that I've dismantling racism framework, which I've used for some years now that speak to this. But, but, you know, it is not black people's jobs to keep white people or, or people with, with white privilege or racial privilege comfortable at all, nor is it our jobs to spend time educating you know, people about how they are exhib exhibiting or how they may be exhibiting racism or racial bias. And yet, I do believe that on the other side of this, especially this is especially for Black people, we have to be vigilant about holding people with racial privilege accountable um, because it impacts us in ways, as Black Americans especially, um, it, it impacts us in very profound ways. And one of the ways is racial battle fatigue, which is a term and a, a, um, a condition that was coined and framed um, by Dr. William Smith in, back in 2008. And so um, again, we, we have to be willing to confront issues on our own, but we also have to cultivate the types of relationships where we can gain allies, white allies who can step in and speak to and handle some of these situations um, for us. But again, it, it has to be a, a person or people who are willing to disrupt status quo. And unfortunately, in my observation and my experiences, not many people function in, in that way and or are willing to do that. Thank you. This next question actually is a nice follow-up. Um, can you please give an example of when accountability was honored? Can I? Yes, absolutely. Actually, I can. I, something just popped in my mind. Um, so there is an agency that I worked with and the leaders of that agency were given feedback by the black members of the agency. And it was interesting because it was at a time where they had actually made some commitments to hire more black staff. They were lacking um, substantially in that area. And so they actually were succeeded in bringing on two black women who were in different roles um, and I don't believe they worked 
together necessarily, but they were um, situated within the organization. Lo and behold, these two Black women were having um, similar experiences in the ways in which they were being approached and or just navigating the environment. And, you know, we commiserated, we met, we talked about some ways that they could work through these challenges. And one of the um, recommendations was that they manage up and that they begin to share their concerns um, with management. From that, they actually met, so management got involved, they met with management, um, the, the director of the, the agency, and then they ended up meeting with um, the full leadership at the top of the agency, the executive leadership. And from there, the executive leadership, you know, they got together, they, they really wanted to um, honor the feedback that they had been given and create um, some viable processes and solutions that could honor um, the experiences that these people uh, had reported. So they cre actually worked collaboratively with them to create um, a, a reporting process, uh, as well as some accountability standards and metrics um, that could be used as a tool and resource to hold people accountable, and particularly uh, for management um, who may not have been being held accountable. Um, I, I will say this, them doing that did not erase and or take away the sting of that was left from, from some of the experiences with, from the things that some, from, sorry, from the circumstances that led to this unfolding in the first place. Um, one of the women was very much impacted by something that occurred. And so it didn't take away the sting um, of, of what occurred. And I think many times people think, oh, if we you know, create a process or create steps to try and address these issues in the future or rectify this situation, that that's supposed to diminish or wipe away the issue or the uh, effects from the issue, from whatever issues occur. Um, yet it was a step in the right direction. And so I'm not asserting that there was full accountability taken, but there, there was some, and that, that was more than I can say from many of the other organizations that I've worked with. So someone said in the chat um, that as a healthcare provider, one thing that uh, they've seen move leadership is when a patient is experiencing racism um, and there is community outrage and pressure. And I believe that. I, I think um, to the point that this person makes, I think that organizing and getting other people um, who are who may be experiencing similar circumstances and sharing your circumstances with each other and gaining each, each other's support, as well as identifying how you're gonna move forward. I think that is critical. Um, in this case, as it pertains to the patient, um, having community come together um, and you know, advocate and or stand up or stand in for this particular person, I think that that um, is vital also. Thank you. And just um, for anybody that may have joined us since I last said this, if you have a question that you would like asked um, of Dante, please feel free to submit that question to me um, via direct message in the chat. So next question, what is key advice you have for youth to navigate through our current school system? Hmm. Wow. I, I think our youth have to be involved in some sort of um, community activity. I know that when I was younger, and I really appreciate um, my mom for the diligence that she took in making sure that I had different outlets. Um, 
One was a, a community center called Arroyo Viejo um, here in uh, East Oakland. And so I think that was very critical, at least for me. Um, and then in addition to that, we need to form our own spaces so that we can reinforce um, our children and not just the learning that is commencing through the white educational apparatus, but we need to be able to provide other forms of education in, in introducing uh, materials that speak from the Black experience, you know, material by W.E.B. Um, du Bois, um, that, you know, material by, um, I referenced the book that, that's on the list that I shared, uh, Kwame Ture, Black Power, uh, Race Matters by Dr. Cornell uh, West. Um, there, there are many other pieces of literature that are just missing from our, our arsenal as Black people. And we need it, not just because we need to learn about Black people, but we need insights. We need to understand what our members who belong to the Black race and the Black identity organization, what they went through and what they left behind for us. I mean, I think there's so much. You can read um, Frederick Douglass's docu um, um, autobiography today and you would think that you're reading a book that was written by someone in 2021, a Black man in 2021. There's so much richness um, that is kept from us as Black people. And so therefore, we the way in which we have been set up to understand white America is through this infantilized, um, or this, this uh, I'm sorry, this not infantilized, but this fantasy of, um, progress, a, a progress narrative. And a progress narrative is only needed for oppressed people that you are trying to provide the idea of hope to in the absence of actual progress occurring. And if you can get people to accept an incremental hope ideas of incremental hope that are tied to massive destruction, degradation, and denigration, then you can continue to keep these people oppressed. And I think one of the things with the Black progress narrative, and this is true for all other oppressed groups, is that we never compare it to the group that is not oppressed. So we, for example, we never compare the progress that women have made, for example, to the advances of white men. We don't do that. We, we compare the progress that, that women have made to very dire circumstances that existed one, two, 300, 400 years ago. We never compare black progress and the strides that have been made and the things that are being made, I'm sorry, the things that are being done um, to that of white people. And the other thing is even the idea of progress, it's all through white Eurocentricity, white standards of how one should be living, how one should be um, um, succeeding um, and so on and so forth. And so we have to begin a process of decolonization. We have to decolonize our minds. We have to decolonize our spirits because th these things have been ingrained with, within us as Black people and, and other people of color. And I, I think it just serves to further um, marginalize and, and mismanage the situation that is occurring um, within the Black community. Okay, next question. Can you speak to how Black men have internalized all of this hatred? Has it impacted their physical? Absolutely. And I would, let me start off by saying this. If any group, if any group, any group of people, any community of people had experienced what Black men have experienced in this country, 
constantly being targeted by the American government, constant, constantly being targeted by these institutions, having your entire um, community disrupted generation after generation after generation, um, you would be responding and reacting in the same way. And I don't necessarily, I'm not gonna coin it or reinforce the idea of anger. Um, and and, and I, I can, I guess, to say that it's a justified anger. Um, you know, many of us are justifiably anger, angry, and, and, and I guess I'm going back on what I said, I will use that language. Um, but many of us are justifiably angry. We are justifiably discontented because of the conditions that have been thrust upon us. And I know some people are probably hearing me speak and, and saying, wow, it sounds like Dante is saying that Black people have just been victims. And we have, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Um, but it, there's an internalized anger and it's ongoing because we continue to be left out. Like if you want us to conform, if you want us to assimilate, if you want us to um, you know, be here, then at least provide us with some type of opportunities to succeed in this culture. But if you're not going to do that and, and where we're going with this, with all of the conditions that we as black people face and particularly black men face in this society, then you may as well just commit the genocide <laughs> because whether it's sudden or, or gradual, that, that's what's happening. And, and, and I, I call on um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, work and you know, references he began to make to genocide in the late 1960s. Where, and in his speech at Stanford University, he also gave the, the same speech um, somewhere else. I can't remember exactly at this moment. But he says, the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. And I absolutely believe that when you look at the actions that the American government has taken against Black people that really stem from um, the, the periods before, but there's something substantial that happens in the early 20th century, which is that book I referenced, The Passing of the Great Race uh, by Dr. Madison Grant. Um, and he says, I actually wasn't gonna go here, but I, but I feel like I want to. Um, but back to these slides, because he, in, in what I think is important to, to recognize is that Hitler called on this book um, as his Bible. He, he held this book, he regarded it rather, as his Bible, and he followed what America was doing with the weaker races, what Madison Grant referred to as the weaker races, right? And so Grant says in this book, and this is 1916, he says, whenever the incentive to imitate the dominant race is removed, the Negro, or for that matter, the Indian, reverts shortly to his ancestral grade of culture. In other words, it is the individual and not the race that is affected by religion, education, um, and so on. He says, uh, Negroes have demonstrated throughout recorded time that they are a stationary species and that they do not possess the potentiality of progress or initiative from within. Progress from self-impulse must not be confounded with mimicry or with progress imposed from without by social pressure or the slaver's lash. A rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years as well as enable us to get rid of the undesirables who crowd our jails, hospitals, and insane asylums. The individual himself can be nourished, educated, and protected by the community during his lifetime, but the state, through sterilization, must see to it that his line stops with him, or else future generations will be cursed with an ever-increasing load 
of misguided sentimentalism. This is a practical, merciful, and inevitable solution of the whole problem and can be applied to an ever widening circle of social discards, beginning always with the criminal, the diseased, and the insane, and extending gradually to types which may be called weaklings rather than defectives, and perhaps ultimately to worthless race types. So different states here in America, in the United States, begin to forcibly sterilize people. And in one particular case, and I mentioned this previously, Buck v. Bell, concerning Carrie Buck, this state, this case made its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in Buck v. Bell that compulsory sterilization of the unfit, including the intellectually disabled, for the protection and health of the state did not violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And so you've got states, state after state after state, that erects a eugenics board in, in virtually every state in the United States, or, or 49 out of 50, I think it was every state. Um, but they erect a eugenics board and they begin to keep a tally on how many people are being uh, uh, sterilized, uh, forcibly sterilized, hysterectomized, tubal ligation, as they, um, uh, in some cases, as they called it. And you've got Niall uh, Ruth Cox, who in um, 1965, at the age of 18, after she had her first baby, was forcibly sterilized against her will. And she gained the support of the ACLU and, and other entities. Um, but again, between 1929 and 1974, and this is in North Carolina, you've got 7,600 people who were sterilized and 5,000 of them were black. You know, if you add to this equation, the other Supreme Court decisions in 1926, Corrigan v. Buckley, which upheld that again, racial restrictive covenants were legal. And that was the, the case until 1953, uh, up until the Barrows ruling. You've also got the Euclid v. Ambler decision in 1926 that fortifies um, racial zoning, racial zoning ordinances, city to city, locale to locale, state by state. And, you know, we have to begin to see these things, all of these actions as, as coordinated acts of racialized terror and genocide that have been facilitated by the Amer US federal government. And only then can you get to the 70s with the um, Supreme Court decision in seven, 1973 that provided that different community, different locales could use their property taxes to fund education. And you see the evolution of parochial schools, charter schools, all of these institutions where white people are literally pulling their children out of the public school system and placing them in these schools. And then you've got disinvestment of the educational system that begins um, through that period. You've also got the Bakke decision in 1978, um, where this guy, Alan Bakke, fights you know, affirmative action. He ends up winning um, a case that he brought against UC Davis Medical School because they didn't let him in. Um, and he says, you know, you all shouldn't be allotting these spaces um, based upon race. Never, never mind that you know, prior to this period, Black people were being discriminated against and not being allowed or unable to get into these, these institutions. He says, I want my place. And he actually wins the case that begins to chip away at affirmative action and the way in which that was supposed to um, really prevail and be in favor for um, communities of color. So, you know, then and only then can you understand the Reagan era, the Bush senior, Clinton, Bush Jr., Obama, like all of these things, these activities, these legislative and judicial activities that have taken place that have continued to disenfranchise and disposition and disempower 
people of color and most severely black people in this country. Thank you. I know a few more people just joined us. Um, we're almost coming to an end. We have 25 more minutes. So this is the last call. Um, for any questions you may have, you can submit them to me um, directly via uh, the chat. You can send me a direct message. And moving on to the next question. Um, what do you do to mitigate the fatigue you spoke about earlier? Wow. <laughs> wow. I don't even know where to begin with this. I um, would really recommend finding, having a support system one, really trying to locate one, a community that of people who understand your circumstances and the challenges that you face every day. I think two, finding a therapist, someone that's good, someone of your own racial ethnic background that can relate to you, that can understand um, racialized trauma. Um, I know some people right now who are trying to work on getting that into the DSM as an actual diagnosis because we are faced with a state of utter terror that is inescapable. And particularly as it pertains to Black people, you know, I, I scale a con the the, um, the reality um, through the term anti-blackness, you know, this reality of anti-blackness that we remain within. The con it's a context that we remain within that is inescapable. And so you need someone who can understand anti-blackness, who could potentially provide you with resources and assistance and help. Um, that will enable you to be able to uh, navigate the circumstances better. But there's, there's truly no escaping it. And, and I have to be very honest in naming that I have been through so much personally within my life that, you know, some things that I faced with different institutions that, where I was an employee and, and work, working for these institutions and these things almost pushed me over the edge and I did not see a way out. So I would, you know, I, I honor and, and want to raise up anyone who might see themselves, you know, at that point or anyone who's been at that point, but make sure you notice when those things are happening, you know, as you begin to, um, be impacted, recognize the impacts and how they're showing up in different ways. Is it showing up through your eating? Is it showing up through a, a lack of an ability to get um, good sleep and rest at night? Um, is it showing up in you know, your work, you not being able to um, function and or um, maintain attention for a long period of time? Like these are all things that you need to pay attention to. Are, are you feeling pain in your body? Are you um, having any type of um, um, inflammation or headaches or migraines? Like these are things that we have to pay attention to because the process of deterioration happens gradually. And many times we don't recognize that's what that's what the, the the occurrence of it or the occurrences of it or, or the things that may be happening to us but it's important that we recognize those things so that we can begin to take care of ourselves there is the resource that i spoke about and i'm actually going to try to get the link right now i have it saved somewhere so with that said alexis you can go on to the next question okay Sorry, right, people are like sending stuff, so it's making my screen bounce. Okay. Have you thought of very deliberate ways to disrupt the white normative perspective, such as using white people as a reference group for research metrics that will be in their favor? Can you, you know what, for some reason that didn't come through, but just the last part of it. Can you read that over for me? 
Have you thought of very deliberate ways to disrupt the white normative perspective, such as using white people as a reference group for research metrics that will be in their favor? Hmm. I don't, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Um, can you interpret, the, interpret it for me somehow? I could try. Okay. Um, I think, <laughs> I think there, um, so the question is, have you thought of deliberate ways to disrupt the white normative perspective? And then I think they're using the example of how white people are always often the reference group for research metrics oh. as a white normative perspective. So are there ways yeah. to, deliberate ways to disrupt that? Yeah. Um, I think, again, one of the things is we have to reframe whatever the context is that we think you know, we are coming to or seeing, we have to begin to dismantle within our minds, you know, how we've been taught to think about or come to any particular um, situation. And we have to reject, you know, the, the white normative um, standards as the basis and or um, foundation or frame, um, that we use when coming into any given situation. Um, for example, with my book and you know my research process, I didn't, I wasn't compliant to the you know, standards of research as we know them. And I made it very clear in writing the book uh, up front, thanks to Dr. Rochelle Rogers Art, uh, that I was not, I was going to be non-compliant. And also I referenced other research. Um, and pedagogical frameworks that were from the perspectives of black and brown people. Um, Jarvis um, Givens being one of them, um, Laura Rendon uh, being another, um, Sean Tohiwai uh, uh, Smith being another. Um, and that was very critical and important, at least for me. Uh, we have to reject white Western world uh, principles as the center and or ideal for how we are assessing and coming to any given situation. But I, I believe that that is a learning process because I am myself um, in recovery from white supremacy. I was thinking about this the other day. I said, I think that's gonna be my next book. So I'm saying it here first. Um, I am in recovery from white supremacy. So that means that I wake up with it, I go to bed with it because it's the foundation of everything. It's really all that I know. So how do I create a different relationship within myself and to myself that can challenge and hold accountable some of the um, very toxic ways that I have been indoctrinated with um, in, in frames of thinking and patterns of thinking that I have been indoctrinated with? How do I work to change that. And that is a process that requires uh, a lot of effort, a lot of intention and attention. And it is, it's a consistent practice for me. Thank you. Um, this next question. Uh, oh, by the way, Lex, I apologize. I just wanted to say, and this is for everyone who's here. Um, oh, I think I put the wrong one in there. I got to go back and dig up another. That's okay, keep going. <laughs> okay, this next question, um, it's kind of long. I'm gonna read it as is. Um, so I just wanted you to listen to the parts of it because I don't know how to shorten it. Um, it seems the creation of hip hop music stems from a reflection of their environment that was created from white America, as well as a protective mechanism to rebel against white America. The music is strictly seen as a part of urban African-American culture, but still it has ingrained itself in American culture as a whole through sports, everyday media, etc. It has given our people power and unified us, putting African-American celebrities who normally wouldn't be seen in American spotlight. Youth today of many races idolize many Black rappers using the N-word amongst one another, highlighting a quote from the late Paul Mooney, everybody wants to be an N, but nobody wants to be an N. 
but it also harms us as most of the music is about guns, drugs, violence, and negative depictions of women. Um, I'm sorry, sorry for this quote, but many, most African-American youth who buy into the music only see success through sports and music. Furthermore, white, much of white society only sees potential in us through sports and music. What is your observation of this predicament that we face today? Does hip hop ultimately help or hurt our people? So I believe that, first of all, I wanna say this, I'm an avid fan of Tupac Shakur and some of his music, not necessarily all of it, cause I don't, I haven't, I don't think I've listened to all of it, but some of his music and I do, what I can appreciate it, at least for the rap element of hip hop is that those individuals were being very blatantly honest about how they experienced life, how they were socialized um, at a time um, at, you know, through any period or at any, you know, through any period or any given time um, during their childhood, during their adulthood and so on. And so, you know, who am I to stand in judgment of that? Just like I'm, I'm expressing myself um, through this book, I don't think there's anything more appropriate about me writing a book and sharing it in the ways in which I've chosen. This is just my gift of expression um, versus the way in which they are choosing to express uh, or have chosen to express their experiences as, as, a black, as black people. I think the problem with much of it is that we amplify um, black people and people of color through pathologies. And so it becomes about, you know, women being exploited through rap, but we're not paying attention to the ways in which the white machine of television, of, you know, movies that, that are made in Hollywood all the time, how they exploit women, how they exploit LGBTQ people, um, how, like, we're not, we're, we want to provide, we want to focus many times, most of the time, on making something wrong with Black people. That's not necessarily wrong. Um, these people and I myself are just results of our environment. I think the way in which I have chosen to express through writing this book is more aligned within, through, within the, the bounds of white Anglo Eurocentricity. And so it makes it more palatable for some people. Oh, wow, this is scholarship. This is great research. But we need to start understanding and, and seeing the Tupac Shakurs or the Biggie Smalls or the Little Kims or the Trinas or the Nicki Minajs as a part of research as well, uh, because they are leaving behind a history um, that will be accessed by many people in years to come, and they will be referencing, you know, these people's experiences in terms of understanding what Black life, to some degree, not all, but to some degree, uh, but what Black life was like during this period in hip hop culture or in Black, you know, hip hop uh, culture. Um, is that any different from what I'm expressing in my book? I absolutely do not think so at all. I think uh, much of it is in alignment. Um, and I think we have to get do really work at decolonizing our minds and, and concepts and the ways that we've been guided to think about things so that we can stop pathologizing Black people, so that we can stop making Black and Brown people the problem. You know, they're creating this. You know, it, it, we talk about, um, and I think part of the, the, in the question was, there's an emphasis in hip hop culture on, on guns and violence. This country was founded on guns and violence. And that gun, th th that violence was legitimized, memorialized and perpetuated for centuries against indigenous people. There was not just one war and then, oh, you know, we won land from indigenous people. There were hundreds of wars that occurred that are documented and maybe, maybe even more outside of the outside of the more than 300 that I know that I found that are that are documented that have been documented and so 
um, legalized terror and lynching against Black people where governors, uh, members of Congress, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, state legislatures were involved, where local law enforcement was involved against Black people. And then all of a sudden, we want to talk about um, the ways in which Black people focus on guns and violence, as though that's not a historical faction and or tenet of this culture. It's, it's cultural and it is acceptable and highly and widely embraced by Americans and particularly white Americans. And we've got violence going on in the under the auspices of the government and how you know, policies are designed and or enforced in favor of white communities and many times against um, black and brown people. And that has continued to go on. So, you know, what is it that we see and or are dealing with through the frame of violence or violent behavior? Like, I think all of this deserves a lot of unpacking and deep consideration. Otherwise, what we will perpetuate is the idea that Black people are somehow this rambunctious um, and or you know, stereotypic group that is of this nature of, of insufficiency and, and deficiency, when that is not at all what's going on. We are a people who are responding to and reflecting the ways in which we've been colonized. And none of this, um, in terms of our expressions of ourselves, belongs to us. It's the easiest way for me to, <laughs> to say that. Thank you. Um, someone sent me two links to where you can find a Black or African American therapist. So I put those links in the chat for everyone. Thank you who's so much. In that resource. Um, and the, so other thing, the other link I put in there um, is a link to um, the racial battle fatigue document that I referenced. Not the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation, but there's a, a document that actually provides, two documents actually, that provides more detail and description around it if you've not heard of it before. Share that with your therapist, share that with your coworkers. Talk to them about the ways in which you are impacted by racism and racial bias every day. The other link that I put in the chat, and I'll put this back, is a course that I teach currently um, through UCSF. It's called Understanding the Roots of Racism and Bias anti-Blackness and its links to whiteness, white racism, privilege, and power. Um, this course offers 16.25 um, CME to both um, to, to physicians, nurses, physician assistants, um, to behavioral health um, pro professionals, um, LCSWs, um, and so on. And it also um, provide 16 hours of continuing le legal education credit to lawyers in California. So if you know of any uh, who work for your organization, please invite them. Um, there's also, I think this year, what's different this year than last year is that there is a student rate that um, we agreed upon to make the course more accessible. And also it's available for anyone who wants to attend, members uh, from the community. And that rate is, um, I think, half the rate for, or less than half the rate for physicians and for lawyers. Thank you for sharing that information. I think um, we have probably time for just for one more question. Six minutes left, and I think some of what you just said probably speaks to this, but um, the question is, now that I've read the book and been made aware, what can I do next? <laughs> You can um, read the additional references um, that are at the end of the book that, that I uh, have highlighted and, and either quoted and or referenced that are at the end of the book. I think for Black people, some of the books that we need to read, um, and I, I highlight these in the work, um, the works of Dr. E. Franklin Frazier and the Black Bourgeoisie, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, du Bois, du Bois um, Black Reconstruction in America, that's another one. Um, Black, um, um, Black Power, 
by Charles Hamilton and Dr. Kwame, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Stokely Carmichael, who is formerly known as um, Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton, they collaborated on that book. Um, the book that I referenced earlier, When Affirmative Action Was White by Ira Katz Nelson, um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, Race Matters by Dr. Cornel West, I mentioned that earlier too. Um, the Shaping of Black America by Lerone Bennett Jr. Um, the History of White People by Nell Irving Painter. Like these are all books that like, if you haven't read them, I would encourage you to, to make that like your, those some of your next reads. Um, and Birth of a White Nation by Jacqueline Battalore, similar to, I referenced her work in Theodore Allen, the, the Invention of the White Race, as well as Joe Fagan's work, um, The White Racial Frame. Uh, read all of these books, please. And then let's have a conversation. Well, thank you so much everyone for joining us. This was a very informative and fruitful session. Um, thank you so much for your participation in this session. Um, because we have a couple minutes, I got this question privately, but I was gonna try to find out offline. Um, but we have a couple minutes. When you were going to say, can I say hi to Melinda Hugh? <laughs> Good to see you. You were going through the list of who can get CME credit. So somebody was clarifying about nurses because they said nurses get CEU credit, but do nurses get credit for your course or is it? Nur yes, nurses get CEU credit too. And again, it's 16.25 hours. Oh, I want to say hi to my little sister, Alyssa Jones Garner. I see her on Gloria Berry. Wow. <laughs> These are my tribes. JJ, Jayantra Henderson, my little sister. What about social workers? Can the LCSWs get credit for the course? Yes. Yes. So if you read the description, uh, it entails all of that information uh, in, in the description of the course. And again, if you want a, a full examination about the the magnitude of anti-Blackness and really the construction of it um, in this country, please attend this course. Hey, Nia. Hey, Don. Really great to see you, you all. All right, there's nothing else. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Viva. Us. And that yeah. concludes our event. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to send a link. Oh, I also wanted to put this link in there. Before you go, um, my book was entered into a Reader's Choice Award. And so um, it's up for this award. And I want to, I'm going to put the link here in the chat. If you can, please. Um, go and vote for my book. You can just click on the link. And I think if you click to like the fifth page, if you scroll, then you'll be able to see it. I really would appreciate that. And again, I hope that you all can um, attend the, the either the course or one of the upcoming events. I've got a book signing that's coming up in May where I'll be doing a lecture um, the first hour and then doing a signing um, the this, this second hour. And then there's also an event that I'm doing with the African American Museum and Library here in Oakland. And that is on April 23rd. And it's a virtual also. So I just put the link to that in the chat. If you want to attend, we'll have more time together and we can talk more then about the book. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dante. Love you. Love you too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dante. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis, also for hosting. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. Keep up the good work. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you.